Good evening. Thank you very much for everybody coming out tonight. Thanks to the League of Women Voters, the NAACP. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Thank you to all the candidates. Very important process we're here to do tonight. And we're here to go ahead and ask some questions, get some answers, and engage in the political process, which is a great thing. I'm from St. Mary's County. My family's been here for generations. We were, my mom was a school teacher. My dad was an attorney in Leonardtown. He's now a retired gentleman farmer. I have, the, my wife and I have the farm next door to him. I'm married to Karen Bailey. We have uh, two children. Uh, Tab is 10, Helen is 14. And we <clears throat> have them in the public schools. They uh, both are getting a really good education, one in uh, Chattagon, one in Letty Den. I was a policeman for 30 years. I worked for the Natural Resource Police. I have since retired. Uh, being a public servant for 30 years, I decided, you know what? I really enjoyed being a public servant. I wanted to continue. That's why I decided to jump into the race to be your senator. Some of you remember Paul Bailey, or Senator Paul. We called him Uncle Paul. My uh, uncle, or great uncle, uh, Trent Hall, he was the Republican senator for 16 years here in St. Mary's County back in the uh, 60s, 70s, when it was not popular to be a Republican in St. Mary's County. Now it's turned around, it is a little bit more popular to be a Republican. The <clears throat> When I worked, I worked up through the ranks. I started as a game warden here in St. Mary's. I worked in Calvert. I moved up and I ended up running a lot of undercover operations, working uh, around the state and then around the East Coast, working in different uh, different areas, working on things involving uh, people taking a, making a fiduciary income of illegal activities with our resources. While I was there, I ended up being uh, working for the legislature. I worked as the executive assistant, and I managed the legislature then. I worked with senators, delegates. It gives me a great uh, platform so that I can hit the hit the ground running when I get to Annapolis. I think, obviously, there's very important things that we need to uh, work on. Public safety, school safety, education, health care, the environment. They are all things that are very important to us here in St. Mary's County, Calvert County, and Southern Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Brewer? Uh, good evening. My name is Thomas Brewer. I hope you don't mind if I just sit while I give my talk. I'm not a big fan of public speaking, so I'm just going to spit out as much as I can in the next three minutes. Uh, I wanted to give some background on myself and my family. I was uh, raised in a nonpartisan house. My dad is here tonight, and I appreciate him coming. This is the first year that he voted in a primary. And I think it's a big problem that independents don't get an opportunity to vote in the primary, but he's been an independent my entire life. He changed over to the Democratic Party just to be able to support me in this race, uh, and I love him for it. Uh, I would like to see independents be able to vote in the primary. Uh, because I was raised in a nonpartisan house, we were happy to call out either side that was being greedy or hypocritical or didn't have the best interests in mind for the people that they represented. So I took that in mind when I decided to run for office. It's not something I ever thought that I'd want to do. My background is I uh, grew up in the area. My parents met at St. Mary's College as freshmen. They stayed in the area afterwards and wanted to start their roots. When I was born, they were renting a house down Dow Road. We moved around a couple times. We finally settled in Wildwood when I was about four and a half. My parents still live in that house now. I went through the public school system here in St. Mary's from Greenview Knowles all the way to St. Mary's College in Maryland. My parents on the monitor. After I graduated there, I left the area to go to Baltimore to study at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Became a pharmacist. When I graduated, I moved back into the area. I got a job at CVS in Leonardtown. And then after six months, I left for an opportunity to work in an independent retail pharmacy, St. John's in Hollywood, which is now a CVS. Uh, it took me about a year to be disenchanted by the retail pharmacy industry. Saw a lot of problems in healthcare, and I didn't see myself being able to do much from behind the counter. So I took the opportunity to leave and try to find some other work. 
worked out of the college a little bit, teaching organic chemistry labs. I got the opportunity to be a sustainability coordinator, and that's kind of where I caught the environmental bug. I wanted to get involved in local politics, so I uh, joined the Commission on the Environment. Within a month, I became the president because the vice president was the acting president because someone stepped down. They were looking for somebody to take the lead, so I've been that for the past five years. When people ask why I jumped up to the state level instead of starting at the county level, I tell them that everything that I wanted to address was better addressed at the state level, from health care cost, the opioid epidemic, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to step out. After being held up at St. John's <coughs> Pharmacy, I left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, education, I grew up in the public school system. I graduated, I tell people that I graduated with a mortgage, just no house, because uh, student loan debt is a serious problem that's affecting the economy. And as Commission on the Environment President, the environmental concerns that I address, like food waste and traffic congestion, were better addressed at the state level. So it was an easy decision for me to start by going for the position that I thought would do the most good. I uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you very much. Now we'll start the questions. Um, Mr. Brewer, how experienced are you in the operations of the Maryland General Assembly, and can you, we count on you to hit the ground running? Uh, yes, so I've spoke at a judicial hearing uh, up in Annapolis on three different occasions uh, representing my area as a pharmacist, so I have a basic understanding of how the legislative branch works in Maryland. I have a good friend who became a lawyer and works for the Department of Legislative Services. For those that don't know, those are the lawyers that help legislators draft legislation. Not every legislator is a lawyer, so they don't know the lingo. I know healthcare lingo, but I don't know law lingo. But having a friend in the Department of Legislative Services makes it easy to come up with legislation that'll be helpful addressing the needs that I've identified from residents and done my best to research and try to understand where effective change can be made. Thank you. Mr. Bailey? Same question. Do you need me to read it again? Okay. Thank you, Doug. So in my experience in the legislature, uh, during the early administration, I was uh, in charge of the legislature for the Natural Resource Police. So I often testified on bills, I drafted bills, I did bill reports, I met with legislative services, I met with senators, I met with delegates. Um, we have worked together. We've got, uh, I got several bills passed. Um, we were grassroots. I was the president of the Paternal Order of Police. I worked uh, tireless, tirelessly uh, several bills. One of the first bills that I got passed uh, for my members was Lyme's uh, disease. You have Lyme's disease and you're a police officer now, you get a disability retirement. Uh, that was a bill that I worked on tirelessly for my uh, people that I represented. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for um, Mr. Bailey. Um, you always mention county relatives who have been public servants. Why do you feel this has given you the ability to be a state senator? I'm not sure <clears throat> that having a relative that was a state senator gives me a leg up. What I will say as a little boy, uh, getting to sit in the balcony of the Senate and listen to my Uncle Paul when he actually, and he was a great orator, when he would be there talking and representing the people of St. Mary's and Calvert County, right? It was a way that you grew up and you had a pride um, for representing people here. That's something that has been missing. Um, and I think that's something we need to bring back to our county, show people what our value system is, how proud we are to be from here, and that's, that's what I think I bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Brewer. Why do you think, what do you think is the primary cause of the op opioid crisis? What can you do to fix it? Uh, if you want to talk about the primary cause, you'd have to go back to Arthur Sackler. He was, the, uh, he was a psychologist that didn't practice medicine. Instead, he started a newsletter and also a, a, a pharmaceutical um, marketing company which has its conflicts of interest but if you go through the history of Arthur Sackler you'll see that when he, did, when he created his company 
uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, which is behind OxyContin, he sent out drug reps to uh, convince doctors that it was a non-addictive medication. They paid a $600 million settlement to the Department of Justice. This is hard to answer in one minute, so I'm going to try to get through it. Uh, they admitted fault in sending out uh, their uh, drug reps to send misinformation to doctors. As a result, uh, doctors went from prescribing opioids for cancer meds and severe trauma to everything from headaches, knee pain, back pain, uh, and the common uh, prescriptions that we see now. So I think it's important to re-educate some of the physicians that have been miseducated in the past by drug reps, and it's also important to set up some uh, uh, educational opportunities to prevent people from falling into that trap. This question is for both candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Brewer. Name two priority issues you would bring before the General Assembly in regards to St. Mary's County, and why are they priorities? Uh, I'd say one of the biggest priorities is health care uh, cost. Uh, if you talk to the Board of Education, they will say that one of the reasons that their budget has been stressed so much is that they went to a pay-as-you-go uh, health care system. And uh, CareFirst is the number one insurance company in Maryland, and they've admitted that the number one increase in cost is a uh, drug cost and if you ask anybody around that's affected by that they will tell you the same so i believe that transparency among what are called pharmacy benefit management companies pbms if you don't know about them i please ask you to learn because they're a big problem within healthcare right now their intention is to lower the cost of drugs but they work with insurance companies drug companies uh, drug retail stores like cvs and uh, hospitals and all of those have seen uh, pretty impressive profits uh, even since the ACA or Obamacare. So uh, providing an opportunity to uh, increase transparency and accountability uh, between some of these organizations that haven't really shown any increase in outcomes or decrease in cost is important on that state level. Mr. Bailey, do you need me to repeat the question? Please. Okay, name two priority issues you would bring before the General Assembly in regards to St. Mary's County and why are they priorities? Well, the first thing that I think we should bring forward um, just like I said the last time we were here, is tighten up on the funding for school safety. The governor had done a great job in providing the funds uh, in the bill that would be reoccurring year after year. We got a bill um, this last year that was only funded for one year, and then it was going to work with grants. We need to go back, tighten that up, and get some more money for that. The uh, second thing that, uh, that I think we need to address, and we need to address it right away, is health care and prescription care for state employees because as a result of uh, the O'Malley administration they cut what state employees have and their ability to provide for themselves in their later years right now that is a problem we need to jump in and fix it right now thank you thank you the next question is also for both candidates and we're going to start with um, Mr. Bailey um, Senator Steve Waugh established a bipartisan group of military veterans for veterans issues. Since neither of you are veterans, how do you plan to work with veterans issues? Veterans obviously are extremely important to us, extremely important to me. Um, first thing that I did about this was go meet with George Owens. He is the Secretary of Veterans Affairs for the governor. Um, Senator Wall had excluded him out of some of his uh, meetings, right? <clears throat> Secretary uh, Owens is the one that controls the money. He controls the way that we work in Veterans Affairs. Um, I have had several meetings with him personally, and I think we will do very well together. The first bill that he and I have already discussed is a suicide prevention bill uh, for veterans. And we are going to work forward towards that. And the big thing is we're going to put it in the health department where they have the funding and the resources to treat and help the veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brewer, do you need me to repeat the question? Uh, no, I think I got it. Okay. All right, so when it comes to uh, health care, uh, especially among uh, veterans, certainly mental health is the most important. Job training is something that they receive in the military, and making sure that they can transition to a job here is very important as well. Regarding health care, mental health is something that's stigmatized and needs to be destigmatized. It needs to be something that's more accessible uh, and more well accepted by 
uh, veterans, but when it comes to the health department, as my opponent said, uh, it's hard to get behind the governor when he cut $22 million in health department spending. Uh, health department uh, agencies across the state are the only agencies and departments in the state that have not returned to pre-recession funding. So if we're going to focus on something that can really help veterans, I would very much like to see the funding for the health departments in our local counties and agencies be able to maintain the ability to take care of those uh, with mental health issues uh, where the VA sometimes can be lacking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is also for both candidates. We'll start with Mr. Brewer. Besides more armed deputies, how would you work to keep schools safe? Uh, school safety is an issue that everybody is concerned about. I went through school when Columbine happened. I was terrified. I saw bullies in the uh, in the hallways and, and was a tiny kid. I, I got over five feet tall my freshman year. I didn't weigh more than 100 pounds until my sophomore year. Uh, so I certainly see uh, the fear that there is uh, uh, among students in schools now, especially with uh, school shootings and the prevalency that we've seen. When it comes to school shootings and when it comes to shootings in general, in Maryland recently, we've seen Great Mills High School and also the newspaper of Annapolis. Both of those were cases of what I would call toxic masculinity in which guys felt that girls wronged them in a way that made them feel that it was okay to take out their anger in a way that I feel is completely inappropriate and not acceptable but trying to identify that kind of toxic masculinity early on in any kind of uh, oppressive, oppressive uh, behavior, whether it be racism or sexism, uh, you can identify that in schools and stop it at, a, at an early start rather than letting it go to a dangerous place. Thank you. Mr. Bailey, give me a question. Sure. Besides more armed deputies, how will you work to keep schools safe? The thing that we need to do to keep our schools safe is to work with our sheriff, our school board, our superintendent's office, and our commissioners. They're the ones that fund it, right? The issue that's going on right now, I just had a discussion with uh, Dr. Smith and with Sheriff Cameron. The fact is they have weekly meetings with Comstat where both of their representatives meet, they address every single issue that happens in our schools. Our schools are becoming safer every day because of what they are doing. The issue for how I can help, when they identify places that can receive and need additional funding, then that is the way that the state can help the county, right? We can then step up, they bring their issues to us, and we can help them. This is not where we dictate to them what should happen in their schools. They should use their resources to come to us. Thank you. This is for both candidates as well, and we'll start this, this question with Mr. Bailey. Um, your views about renewable energy, and will you support the offshore wind farm that was approved by Maryland in 2013? Being in the fact that I worked for 30 years uh, protecting the environment, I would like to see some more studies about this. Because of the fact that the reason that is, is there are two sides to every story. And the wind farms, yes, extremely big with renewable uh, energy and resources. But the fact is, I happen to work with the biologists in Annapolis who were doing the studies on how many and how it would affect our migratory bird population on the East Coast. Because the same area that the wind uh, is generated is the same area that the migrant birds use. So I would like to uh, look at that study more in depth before I say this is the way to go. Thank you. Mr. Brewer, do you need me to repeat the question? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Uh, regarding the uh, flight patterns of birds, uh, ornithologist studies have shown that windows kill as many birds as uh, wind turbines. I don't think it's a concern that we need to worry about or has been shown in other countries that have gone forward with wind turbines. Uh, it's important to note that the base has said that we cannot put wind turbines in certain areas within their flight paths. It affects their navigation, so it's always important to understand the limitations of uh, the potential uh, wind turbines that we could put up. 
but when you look at other wind turbines uh, that have been put offshore, uh, the benefits are numerous, including uh, artificial reefs that are created by the bases that help out with the fishing, the crabbing, the oyster communities. Uh, so it's not just getting uh, renewable energy, but it's also creating an environment that helps uh, proliferate uh, uh, the uh, in environment in the water. I, I think that uh, not pursuing an industry that is creating more jobs that don't require full degrees is absolutely important with the economy that we have in our area. Thank you. This question is for both candidates as well. We'll start with Mr. Brewer. What can you do to help prevent failure of businesses on Route 235, such as closed restaurants, blighted buildings, mini marts, and used car dealers? Uh, regarding businesses on 235, it's extremely important that we make sure that the base stays resilient to BRAC. For those who don't know, BRAC is a base relocation enclosure. It's what brought a lot of the business and economy here to, to our area, but it could certainly take that back away. Uh, and one of the main things that they look at when they're doing a BRAC is how well the local and state governments supported the federal base. So the lack of transportation funding going towards the bridge, towards the intersection at Route 5 and Great Mills Road and towards Leonardtown, all part of uh, new traffic congestion caused by NAVAIR. Uh, if our state does not invest in that and we do have another BRAC where they will consider taking business away, we'll see a lot more business hurt along 235 with small businesses as a result of business leaving the base. So I think it's important if we want to make sure that small businesses uh, are, are strong and sustainable, uh, we need to encourage uh, Annapolis to give back the transportation funding that we send and the gas taxes that we pay. Thank you. Mr. Bailey, do you need me to repeat the question? Please. Okay. What can you do to help prevent failure of businesses on Route 235, such as closed restaurants, lighted buildings, mini marts, and used car dealers? One of the main challenges that we have in uh, St. Mary's County is um, increasing our economic diversity. We have some um, really good things going on on the base, NAVAIR, NAPAD, the Navy Alliance. We all work in, they all work in conjunction with our county. While they work in conjunction with our county, right, that is the way we can move forward to increase our economic diversity in this county. We work, we have a big pass through as it comes through the money chain from the base. Forty some million dollars come right through the base, but it's a pass-through. Only about two billion get to stay here out of that 40 uh, some billion. So the thing is we need to work with our county, we need to increase our manufacturing, we need to increase things like <clears throat> issues like our third building so that we get higher education and we can work forward so we get our economic diversity in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is also for both candidates. We'll start with Mr. Bailey. How will you work to expand the rights of the LGBTQT community? The fact is, the <clears throat> Constitution is very clear. Everyone is created equally. And that is the way that we are going to continue. We're going to make sure that in this world, in our life, that no matter what someone has as a choice, we do not hold that against them, right? And we start that uh, right now in our school system, right? In our school system, we can't wear anything that's offensive. We can't do anything that might offend another person because we want the fact that we're going to treat our uh, children, I uh, treat our People treat everyone as equals. Thank you. thank you. Mr. Brewer, do you need me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. I, I was raised by parents that taught me to try to protect people that were victims of oppression. I was always taught that if there is somebody that is being picked on, uh, your best bet is to defend them uh, until they have proven any reason not to. As far as LGBTQ communities, I. Uh, 
I, I see nothing wrong with letting people do whatever they want as far as a, a government role. I'm, a, I'm one that believes that if you're not infringing upon the rights of another, the government doesn't have a role to, to step in and affect the way that you live your life. Um, I have an uncle that was gay, he passed, but I still consider his partner my uncle. And uh, it was embarrassing for me to learn that they had to hide that from people in the uh, business and their separate business professions and pretend like they weren't who they were. So I have no problem fighting for those that uh, deserve the basic rights that we all have. The next question is also for both candidates and we'll start with Mr. Brewer. Last year, the cab companies tried to stop rideshare drivers. Rideshare drivers provide a service in rural areas without adequate cab and bus service like St. Mary's. What is or was your stand on this issue? Uh, I think you nailed it. We do not have adequate cab services here in St. Mary's County. I've worked at a bar that's had to, I've had to drive people home multiple times because they were not able to access a cab and they weren't able to access an Uber. So the fact that that is a new opportunity for expanding the ability for people to get home responsibly, I am not on the cab industry side on that. If there is an opportunity for competition to enter the market and for a business to uh, provide a service that is uh, needed in the area, such as ours, I don't see any reason why we should defend a larger industry from a smaller industry coming in. If uh, Uber and uh, Lyft and other rideshare companies can provide a service that has a demand in this area, I don't think it's the right of the, I don't think it's the role of the government uh, to protect uh, a larger business. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Last year, the cab companies tried to stop rideshare drivers. Rideshare drivers would provide a service in rural areas without adequate cab and bus service like St. Mary's. What is or was your stand on this issue? I think that this question is best served um, like many other questions that we have because we're from Southern Maryland. Right? We're from a more rural area, but we have very congested areas. Anybody has any questions about that? Just go out here and see the traffic tomorrow morning. The, the issue is cats should be able to be here and they should be able to operate uh, in this area. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Mr. Bailey. You've been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. What do you think can be done to help allow police officers to better perform their jobs? Thank you. And that was a great endorsement. 21,000 uh, brother officers and sisters from around the state endorsed me. Right? Big, <clears throat> big issue that the people I work for and supported all those years and worked with supported me. The issue is policemen are under attack right now all over this country. They're under attack in this state and it's important that we protect the law enforcement officer bill of rights and we protect it for them. We keep it intact because that is something that provides a police officer with the ability to have due process so they are not wrongly treated or wrongly terminated for the fact that they are helping and assisting you. It's the one thing that allows them to go out and do their job and not be looking over their back all the time. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Brewer. This election year, your party is calling for reducing Maryland's prison population by 30%. The only way to do so is by releasing many current inmates early and by refusing to imprison many new criminals. Do you agree with your party's platform? Uh, first off, I'm not beholden to my party. I'm, uh, I'd like to think I'm an independent thinker. Uh, re regarding this question, I think it's important to address the fact that St. Mary's County was the first to do the pretrial release program that we have here. It's been a very successful program, and it takes people that have nonviolent uh, drug uh, crimes as well as people that did not pay their child support, and rather than putting them in jail and having taxpayer money uh, keep them there uh, for a punishable amount of time. Uh, they release them so that they can work to uh, continue to uh, serve the local economy 
uh, and it seems to be economically advantageous. It's been very successful as far as the public safety rating and as well as the uh, return rate for people that show up to court. So it's not like people are getting out and running away or causing more crimes. For those individuals that fit a certain uh, a criminal uh, um, offense, I, I do not think that prison is the right place for them. It can only make them uh, potentially more dangerous. Thank you. Um, next question is for both candidates. We'll start with Mr. Brewer. How can we promote small businesses but still provide workers with living wages, insurance, and other necessary benefits? Uh, this is a complicated question, but I'd be happy to dive in. So, uh, as far as making sure that wages are competitive, I think it's important to give an advantage to the small businesses that have been disadvantaged by big businesses. So when you give, uh, the metaphor I like to say is, uh, if you let people that are over 200 pounds uh, in football take steroids, but people that are under 200 pounds are not allowed to take steroids, that's kind of equivalent what, to what we're doing with big businesses. With regards to vertical integration, all the advantages that big businesses have, uh, by not giving the advantage to small businesses, you are dooming them to failure. So I've worked for small businesses and I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. I've realized that CVS treats their employees like a baby treats a diaper. I've seen that firsthand. I've seen how much better small businesses treat their employees with wages and with respect. Uh, so if I'm going to do anything to try to support uh, good incomes in the state, I would much rather try to see corporate taxes go down on small businesses. And we really need to go after those states that use onshore tax havens like Delaware to move some of their money uh, out of the state to avoid taxes. Mr. Bailey, do you need me to repeat the question? Sure. How can we promote small businesses but still provide workers with living wages, insurance, and other necessary benefits? This question really has to go right to our government and what we've been living with for the past four years with our governor, Larry Hogan, because that's what he's done, right? We have reduced taxes. We have increased jobs. We have done the things that are important for our economy to thrive. And that's what we're doing and that's what we need to continue to do, right? We need to continue to reduce taxes for the people that create jobs Right, so if you make money, you create jobs, it's very easy. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for both candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Bailey. What are your views on gun registration databases? Thank you. As far as a public gun re uh, registration database, I'm opposed to it. We don't need it. Um, it's just the way that uh, people trying to get our guns could absolutely access that database. In Maryland, database already exists, right? The police, we, are, we have it. I just attended training this last month on the new computer system that the state police have in the gun group just to run the database. If there's an issue with, with a person and a firearm or the threat of a firearm, we can run their name and find out any issue they have, right? But as far as any public database, opposed. Thank you. Mr. Brewer? Can you, can you repeat that one, please? Sure. What are your views on gun registration databases? Uh, so I think we need to start by talking about the NRA. In my opinion, the NRA was a fantastic organization back in the day when it started because it uh, taught young boys and girls uh, firearm safety as well as hunting etiquette. I think that's something that was very important and very noble. It has since transformed into a lobbying organization for gun manufacturers and ammunition manufacturers. And I believe that when they try to push public safety as their main concern, they're being disingenuous with their uh, uh, profit motive. Uh, and when uh, my opponent, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, has an A plus rating with the NRA, to me that says that he is unwilling to uh, support any legislation that might hinder anybody's Second Amendment rights, whereas I think that most Marylanders and especially most people in Southern Maryland understand that there are certain opportunities uh, to come up with legislation that is not infringing upon anybody's rights, but simply providing a protective uh, buffer for those people that may intend to harm themselves or others. Thank you. The next question is for both candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Brewer. How would you encourage faith-based organizations 
to assist in responding to crises like drug abuse, domestic violence, racism, and homelessness. Um, in this area, I don't actually think that that's that big of a problem. We have uh, WARM, which is a program in which the churches uh, rotate who takes in homeless people during the cold months. And I think uh, from what I've learned by the people that have organized that, it's a fairly, a fairly successful program that tries to identify those communities that have been displaced and are homeless. Uh, as far as uh, trying to get them to address the opioid epidemic, I think it's important. You know, I had to attend uh, the funeral of a friend of mine that was 25 years old and he died uh, a couple months ago uh, from an opioid ep uh, addiction. And uh, I think that trying to identify that it's an actual problem and, and destigmatize addiction is uh, something that the uh, religious-based organizations can certainly help out in the community. As far as trying to influence them to do so, I think that the best role that government can do is to educate the people. And if that means educating those on uh, religious organizations on how they can address a problem that's really crippling our community, I think that's something we can do. Thank you. Mr. Bailey? Question. How would you encourage faith-based organizations to assist in responding to crises like drug abuse, domestic violence, racism, and homelessness? So I can address this and just talk about uh, myself and my family. Uh, I'm a knight uh, in Immaculate Conception. We do participate very much in the Mormon program but we also have breakfast on Sunday mornings, right? We do drives for the homeless. This is, and whether or not uh, we want to believe it, we have homeless people that live right in St. Mary's County. They live right in Mechanicsville, right where I live, right? And we take care of them, right? We do food drives all winter. We make sure they have coats. We um, work with them. We work as a community together. And that's the way that we get our churches Involved and our churches are involved. I urge every one of you to be involved when you when you work for this. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is also for both candidates. We'll start with Mr. Bailey. What is your position on sanctuary state? It's not sure that we get <clears throat> to use much time. I think we can solve that by saying opposed. There is. Uh, not a place for us as a sanctuary state in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brewer? Uh, I wasn't raised in the church, but most church-going folks I know have empathy, not sympathy, but empathy for people that are trying to escape something worse. If somebody is not a legal uh, resident of the United States, uh, and is trying to go through the process, but has already crossed the border, I think that there is a way to address that that is not so insensitive as simply saying, you do not belong here because you do not fit a certain mold. I think that uh, having worked in the restaurant industry and with agriculture being a big industry in the area, to say that a uh, illegal immigrants are something we're really trying to crack down on is disingenuous because a lot of our economy is propped up on overlooking that so to say you want to take a hard stance would mean that you'd really have to break down some industries in our area thank you um, this is for both candidates we'll start with mr. Brewer can you give an example of a time you bought positive change to our community Uh, yeah, when I went down to St. Mary's College to work after I stepped out of pharmacy and I got an opportunity to be the sustainability coordinator, I was supposed to overlook students and I asked, do you just want me to look over the students or can I try to start some initiatives? And they said, you have six months, you can do what you want. And I got uh, styrofoam removed from the campus and I started a composting project. It's, one, it's what made me want to get involved in the Commission on the Environment for the county. And we have worked with uh, different organizations, whether it's Univer <coughs> University of Maryland Extension Program, uh, or 4-H to set up uh, classes. We've done uh, rain barrel workshops, composting bin workshops, uh, poultry, backyard poultry workshops. Uh, again, I think the best role government can play is to educate the people, which is why I was proud to be president of the Commission on the Environment when we helped uh, to set up some of these educational opportunities for residents. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Do you want me to repeat the question? Sure. 
Can you give an example of a time you brought positive change to our community? Thank you. I think the easiest uh, one would be, which a lot of people in here are familiar when I was a game warden, and we did some of the very large uh, striped bass cases that uh, I was the case agent when we brought the cases. The ones that uh, actually uh, caught the bad guys, we then went forward um, with the prosecution. And after the prosecution, we came back and showed that uh, the, the regulatory process was faulty. So we changed the regulations um, for the entire East Coast, uh, not just one state. I was the one that was there doing it, testifying for it. That brings seven billion dollars to our economy each year. If we hadn't done that case, we hadn't done it that way, we'd be in a moratorium on striped bass right now, and the economy would be losing seven billion dollars a year annually. Those people would not have jobs. They would not have futures. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for all candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Bailey. Even as young people in our community are in need of greater support, our county has three senior centers, but no centers for our youth. Focused on you, so I'm sorry. Please tell us specific actions that you will take to move us forward faster toward building a community center in St. Mary's. Thank you. Community center for our youth is, is a big issue, and we need to move forward with it. Um, met with uh, the Board of Parks and Recs about this exact issue. Uh, one thing they've started to do this year is we're starting to have travel ball tournaments. But we don't just need travel ball tournaments because not only does it do something for our youth, but it does something for our local economy, right? It fills our hotels out here on the weekends. We can have uh, people uh, come here and we can work with basketball. We can work with all of the sports right but we need to make it a priority it would be good for our children it would be good for our families and it would be good for st mary's county and our economy right that's what we have to do is work forward thank you thank you mr brewer uh, so i think my opponent was kind of talking about a, a recreation center when you're talking about a community youth center i think that provides an opportunity for uh, children during the summers to have a place to go that is not um, on the streets for those people that do not have jobs there's a big problem where we don't have enough jobs for young people especially during the summers especially in a place like Lexington Park uh, so my opponent has proudly said he's a, a full supporter of the governor's agenda which last year cut five million dollars for after school and summer programs uh, for public schools so I think that it, it exposes the the agenda is not really caring for the weakest people in our area. Uh, like they said, we have three retirement centers for elderly. We don't have any, any youth centers for the youth. And uh, to not try to recognize that uh, idle hands can be a problem, especially with uh, high school students during the summer, uh, is to not acknowledge a larger problem. Thank you. This question is for both candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Brewer. This past session, the current state delegation secured the highest funding per pupil in history. What will you contribute to improve more funding? Uh, so I think it's important that we make that distinction. The reason for the highest education spending is not because of anything that the governor did, but it's actually because of a state mandate which requires the funding to be connected to the student population. Uh, the 2002 Thornton Commission, which created the funding formula that we have now, created something called the GCEI, which is the Geographic Cost of Education Index. St. Mary's County has one of the lowest in the state. It's intended to help out the 13 counties with 80% of the student population. We get a fraction of what Calvert and Charles uh, receive, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that moving forward because in the next session we're going to talk about a new funding formula uh, with the Kerwin Commission that's coming out. So uh, trying to identify proper funding, you know, when we talk about per people funding in the whole state, that's great. But if you look at per people funding for St. Mary's County, second lowest in the state. Or one of the wealthiest counties in the state. Say, say again. Uh, in what way? Is it, are we third lowest? Hey, Mr. Bailey, did you need me to repeat the question? This past session, the current state delegation secured the highest funding per pupil in history. 
what will you contribute to improve more funding? We have to go back to the original spirit of the Kerwin Commission. And what the Kerwin Commission was brought for was to make sure that rural counties like ours, right, got equal funding. Unfortunately, some of the members on the Kerwin Commission said, no, we don't want that, right? So we started comparing ourselves to many different institutions around the world so we could have um, world-class education. And that is a great idea. But the fact is, we represent St. Mary's and Calvin County, and we need to increase the level of funding we have here. The biggest issue that our local commissioners have is trying to balance their budget, which they do every year, but it's difficult with the cost of education going up every single year. And that's what we need to do is figure a way to increase the funding for our county. Thank you. Thank you. This will be the last question for the candidates, then we'll do the, give, let, have them do their closing remarks. We'll start with Mr. Bailey. Neither of you address domestic violence. Please tell us what changes need to be made to lower the number of domestic violence cases in our community. Education is very important when it comes to domestic violence and it starts at our lowest possible level. One thing that I hope everybody's familiar with here that has children like I do, is that in our school system, we have assemblies where they talk about domestic violence. They talk about dating violence. They talk about the things that are out there that are potentially hazardous to our children. Not only do they stress that, right, but they also talk about the fact what happens to you if you are a victim, right? And we start that right off the bat with our schools right now. And I think that's the biggest issue when we come to domestic violence is the fact of education. We have some great places for people to get help here in Southern Maryland. But the fact is we want to go ahead and let everybody know that it's not okay to hit someone else or to be abused. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burrow. Uh, I would argue that we don't have the infrastructure in place. Pathways and Walden have long waiting lists. Those are the mental health uh, facilities in our area. Uh, to secure funding, to come up with something like tuition reimbursement to try to lure healthcare or mental health care practitioners out of cities and into rural areas, I think would be extremely helpful. But I think it's also important to start, like you said, that education process in schools where you help to try to identify uh, those boys that may seem uh, to be a little bit more violent and to help girls to understand the signs of potential uh, future violence. And, and you know, we, we, that's a big topic uh, on the federal level now, but it's one that should be talked about on the local, state, family, church, and school level. Every level, every age should understand that it's not okay to treat somebody yeah. like lesser than anybody else. And it's important to identify uh, some of those vulnerabilities so that uh, those that are vulnerable can protect themselves. Thank you. Now we'll start with the closing remarks. We'll start with Mr. Brewer. Three minutes. Two minutes. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, this is not something I'm used to. I don't like public speaking. I uh, went into this because I think that there is just a really bad problem with tribalism, with uh, uh, this dependency on the team that you're on, and it excludes the opportunity to bring people together and compromise. I think one of my strengths is being able to research both sides of an argument, make sure I've done my due diligence in understanding the subjects that matter most uh, to the people in my area, and making sure that I know how to address those uh, when I get to Annapolis. I think that one of my biggest strengths is that I just have a fascination with understanding how everything works. So I'm not somebody that is able to accept a recommendation from somebody to vote on something in a certain way. I have to understand who's behind it, the agenda behind it, and who really benefits 
uh, from the legislation passed, and I think that's something that's important to understand. When I identified that drug reps are taking advantage of doctors by giving them miseducation, I also realized that's exactly what happens with legislation and lobbyists. So you have two types of lobbyists. You have advocacy lobbyists that have no money in the game, and you have industry lobbyists. And if you are a legislator that can't see the difference between the two and can't identify when an industry lobbyist is trying to benefit themselves in their industry more than the people that you represent, you won't do a good job uh, as a representative in Annapolis. I, I hope that I've shown today that I have spent the past nine months trying to make sure I understand that which is most important to the people that I hope to represent. I'm so happy that there is a packed house tonight and I'm uh, happy for all the people that are going to watch this on the recordings uh, later. I, I have grown up here. I've worked in large industry and small business. I've worked in the public sector and the private sector. I've seen what I think is most important to address, and I hope that you all agree uh, that I'd be the best candidate. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bailey? Thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to uh, take this time to say that it would be my honor to represent each and every one of you. Whether you came here like my family came here um, generations ago, or whether you came here last year, right? That is the pride of Southern Maryland. That's why we are proud to be from St. Mary's County, because we all come together and we work together for a common goal. I think the biggest issue that I have is I want to be available, approachable, and committed to each one of you. I want you to feel that you can walk to my office, open the door, and say, Jack, this is my issue. And if that issue has to do with your family or personal, whatever it is, your issue is going to become my issue. I want to be committed to each one of you. And that's what I offer you when I run as your state senator. I studied quite a bit about that when I did both uh, my undergraduate work at Johns Hopkins and my graduate work at Hopkins. We studied management, we studied dealing with people, being available, and being able to work with people for a common goal. Our goal is for the citizens and the constituents of District 29. I wanna say thank you and uh, thank you very much. I will tell you, public speaking is a big part of this job. And, uh, and, I, and I just feel I'm pretty comfortable with it. But uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Please uh, remember to vote November 6th. Very important to our process. We need everybody to vote. And remember, education, vote for the first initiative, the lockbox. It will definitely help um, every one of our students in across Maryland. Thank you. Thank you.